بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد We continue reading in the chapter the author he has mentioned رحمه الله تعالى باب صفة صلاة النبي the chapter of the description of the prayer of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and the author رحمه الله تعالى he mentioned many narrations and from them he says عن عبد الله بن مالك ابن بحينة رضي الله عنه أنه قال إن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا صلى فرج بين يديه حتى يبدو بياض إبطيه The author he mentioned the narration of Abdullah ibn Malik ibn Buhayna He is known as Ibn Buhayna His name is Abdullah ibn Malik رضي الله عنهم Abdullah ibn Malik Him and his father they are both companions, radiallahu anhuma, and his mother is known as Buhayna, and she is Buhayna bint al Harith ibn Abdul Muttalibi, and uh, she likewise is from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So we see that Abdullah and his father Malik and his mother Buhayna, all of them are from the companions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and uh, Abdullah ibn Malik, and he is known. As Ibn Buhayna, Ibn Buhayna, radiyallahu anhu, and he died in the year 56 after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is narrating this narration. Inna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana idha salla. The verity of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he would pray, he would separate between his hands until you could see the whiteness from his underarms, meaning from his armpits, sallallahu alayhi وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّ النَّبِيَّ كَانَ إِذَا صَلَّى كَانَ إِذَا صَلَّى It has come in one wording of uh, Sahih Muslim. It has come in one wording of this hadith in Sahih Muslim that he said, كَانَ إِذَا سَجَدَ So whenever he would make sujood. So this is what is intended here. Whenever he would pray, meaning whenever he would pray and he is in sujood, صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فَرَّجَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ That he would separate between his his arms, that he was separate between his arms. فَرَّجَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ أَيْ بَيْنَ عَضُدَيْهِ بَيْنَ عَضُدَيْهِ What عضد, it is the part of the arm that is between the elbow and the shoulder. That is between the elbow and the shoulder. So the Prophet وسلم, whenever he was in sujood, he would separate uh, this part from his body. and He would take him away from his body and he would raise up his elbow sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he would uh, uh, place his hands firmly on the ground, separated from each other, and he would separate his arms, his upper arms, and he would take them away from his body, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until one could see the bayad, hatta yabudua bayadu ibtayhi, ibtayhi, until the bayad, the whiteness of the ibt, would be shown. And the ibt is the armpit, and the underarm. This is called the ibt, and here, He's saying, حَتَّى يَبْدُوَ بَيَّضُ إِبْطَيْهِ And he would spread his arms out, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, until the extent that the whiteness from his underarms could be seen. Could be seen. Meaning the place where the sun does not reach and there's no hair there. Likewise, so uh, compared to the rest of the body, it would be lighter. And in any case, this area, it would be seen. Because of how the Messenger وسلم, when he would prostrate, he would open his arms and he would separate them. And likewise, he would take his arms away from his side. So this narration here is with regards to the clarification of the proper manner to prostrate. More details with regards to that. And that is that the Prophet وسلم, كَانَ يُجَافِي كَانَ يُجَافِي عَضُدَيْهِ عَنْ جَنْبَيْهِ that he used to take his arms away from his body. That he used to take his arms, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, away from his body while he is making sujood. While he is making sujood. And the people of knowledge, they mention uh, about this, and this is because in the prayer, every single body part, it has a specific action of worship in a manner that is prescribed for one to perform with every single body part, the hands and the feet and, uh, and the eyes, every body part, it has a position and it has a specific act of worship suitable for that body part in the prayer. And whenever the prayer is performed properly, then every body part, would, it would get its portion and share 
of that worship that is legislated for the body and the prayer. And from that is that the arms, they are taken away from, from the body. And they are opened up wide and they are separated from the body. And in this manner, the hands are able to prostrate properly. And in this manner, the hands are able to be placed on the ground firmly. The hands are able to be placed on the ground firmly. And likewise, the, the forehead and the, and the nose can be placed on the ground firmly in this manner. Uh, and this is contrary to the one who, gra- who puts himself together and grabs his arms together by his side. And the likes like this, that he will be all uh, bunched together. And the likes like this, leaning one body part on the other. But rather... The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would not do that. And the people of knowledge, they mentioned that this is a sign of laziness. That a person, he would lay his body parts one on top of the other and make pro- and prostrate in this manner. But rather, he would prostrate in a manner that indicates his desire to submit and his uh, raghba. And the fact that he has the desire and the yearning to prostrate. And he would prostrate properly and every body part would go on the ground. And we have seen that in prostration there are seven body parts that have to that have to be placed firmly on the ground. And we have seen that alhamdulillah. And the previous hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas and all the Allahu anhuma. And in order for this to be applied properly, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would separate between his hands and he would spread his arms away from his body. And he would spread his arms away from his body and he would prostrate f- firmly on his hands and his forehead and on his knees and on his toes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in this manner. So this is known as a tajafi with the people of knowledge. A tajafi, yujafi awudayhi an jambayhi. Yujafi awudayhi an jambayhi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he would take and separate his arms away from his sides. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa kana yarfa'u mirfaqayhi. And he used to raise up his elbows. And likewise, at the same time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, placing firmly his forehead and his nose on the ground. And placing firmly his hands on the ground with his fingers pointed towards the qibla, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And likewise, also like this, uh, he would also separate between his stomach and his thighs and there will be a space there and he would not lay his stomach on his thighs likewise all bunched up together as has mentioned before he would not put his stomach on his thighs and put his arms together and in the likes like this and prostrate with his hands and arms on the ground in a manner that uh, uh, in the manner of the one who is lazy and has no desire to prostrate or to worship and the one who is neglectful but rather he would perform the prayer with nashat and he would have energy and he would be alive and he would be active in the prayer and he would place each body part in the proper place on the ground in the proper manner and from that is that he would raise his stomach away from his thighs in prostration placing his knees on the ground with his toes facing uh, towards the qibla and his heels together sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and likewise with his hands firmly on the ground and his forehead and nose firmly on the ground with his hands also spread away from his side spread away from his side in this manner all of the body parts of sujood they are placed firmly and properly on the ground and a person he is far away from having the description of the one who was lazy and kasil by gathering himself and putting, laying one body part on top of the other and prostrating in this manner. But, but rather, every body part will be separate from the other and the prostration points will be placed on the ground firmly and he'll prostrate with humbleness and humility. And likewise, it has been narrated from Maymuna, radiallahu anha, that she said, إن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يجافي يديه حتى لو أن بهمة أرادت أن تمر من تحته لمرت. The very the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he used to separate his arms from his side. He used to open up his arms and separate them from his side to the extent that if a small sheep wanted to go underneath him, it would be able to. It'll be able to. Meaning that he would separate his arms away from himself in this manner. And he would raise his uh, stomach off of his thighs. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would prostrate f- uh, properly. And he would prostrate in the correct manner. Giving each body part its portion of, of worship specifically. Placing each body part on the ground properly. In this manner. This is the methodology and the description of the sujood of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we see in this narration the legislation of a tajafi, a tajafi, tajafi al-abudaini, 
عن الجنبيني to take the arms and separate them from the side in prostration to separate them from the side in, in the prostration and this is in order for the hands to be able to prostrate properly uh, on the ground and to be placed firmly on the ground in this manner and likewise the forehead is able to be uh, placed firmly on the ground as well in this manner and this is in order to be active and be aware and alert in the prayer to give and to give each body part its portion of worship and uh, the people of knowledge they mentioned that this tajafi and uh, separating the arms from the sides in this manner is 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 mentioned with a condition and that is so long as one is not praying in, in the rows and it harms the other worshipers for example if a believer he is praying with his brothers in the ranks and the ranks are tied and if he were to separate his arms in a, in a in a manner like this then maybe it would harm those who are praying next to him so at this time he will not be able to separate his arms because that well-known principle in the understanding of the deen that to remove to remove harm or to prohibit harm or to repel harm or to prevent harm from occurring, this takes precedence over bringing about good. So to apply this sunnah is good. And in this manner, one can bring about a maslaha. But to harm the believers is a mafsada. And this is not good. So therefore, this takes precedence. To not harm the believers and to not disturb the worshippers while they're worshipping and put them in hardship or in, or in difficulty and, or in a tight situation in the prayer. In this manner like this, this takes precedence over applying the sunnah. This takes precedence over applying the sunnah. So if the person he's praying by himself, uh, then he will apply the sunnah properly. And if he is able to uh, apply it somewhat while he's praying in the ranks with his brothers, then it's per permissible for him. But if he were to apply the sunnah and then to harm others, and to harm others praying along with him at this time, he will not spread his arms uh, in this manner and Allah knows best. He will not spread his arms in this manner and Allah knows best. And likewise, similar to this issue, the people of knowledge also they mention the sunnah of making a tawarruk. The sunnah of making a tawarruk in the, in the, the last tashahud of uh, the prayer that has two tashahud. And in the prayer that has two tashahud and the last tashahud is from the sunnah to make tawarruk. And that is that while in the sitting position making the tashahud, al-akhir, uh, a believer, he will set up his right foot with his toes facing forward and he will bring his left foot forward uh, underneath his right leg and he will sit down on his bottom. In this manner, this is called a tawarruk. And this is a sunnah uh, in this position here. But if this is going to cause the ranks to become tight and to harm the person who was praying next to him, then it is not uh, recommended to make tawarruk at this time. So if a person he is able to make tawarruk, if he's praying by himself or if he's praying in the ranks and it's possible to perform that without harming those who are praying next to him, then it's a sunnah for him to do that. But as for the case, if sometimes whenever the ranks are very tight or the individual who is next to him on his side is very close and if he were to make tawarruk, he would, uh, he would put lots of pressure on that person or lean on him or make his uh, prayer difficult, or he would be tightened or restricted in his area, then at this time it is not uh, recommended to make tawarruk. And this is because of that great, great principle in the deen. Dar uh, al-mafasidi muqaddamun ala jalbi al-masalih. That to repel evil and to uh, uh, remove evil, this takes precedence over bringing about good. Over bringing about good so this hadith here again clarifying the noble manner of the prostration of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that is that he would uh, separate between his hands and he would uh, take his uh, arms far away from his sides sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he would raise his elbows and his fingers they will be facing the qibla and his fingers they will be facing the qibla sallallahu alayhi wasallam and likewise as well he would lift his stomach off of his thighs, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he would prostrate in this manner, giving each portion of the body its proper right in, in worship. After this, the author, he mentioned another narration, and he says, Rahimahullah, 
وعن أبي مسلمة سعيد بن يزيد رحمه الله تعالى قال سألت أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه أكان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يصلي في عليه قال نعم The author he mentioned now the narration of Abu Maslama Sa'id ibn Yazid rahimahullahu ta'ala and he is uh, from the tabi'een and from the students of Anas and likewise he's from the students of Al-Hasan al-Basri and other than them from the Salaf he died in the year 132 from the tabi'een wa kana thiqatan rahimahullahu ta'ala Abu Maslama Sa'id ibn Yazid he said I asked Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray in his na'alayn? Did he used to pray in his sandals? And uh, he said, radiyallahu anhu, na'am, yes. And he said, he said yes. So we see here that Abu Maslama, uh, Sa'id ibn Yazid, uh, rahimahullahu ta'ala, he's asking this question, but he's seeking the ruling, and he's seeking the understanding. And some of the people of knowledge have mentioned, because it's as if he's thinking that this is not proper, because of the possibility of the filth or the najasa that could be carried uh, or that could be found on the bottom of the shoe. And it's known that the shoes, they go all over uh, the place and they are uh, subject to becoming dirty and filthy and the likes like this. So he's asking, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray in his sandals? Akana an-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yusalli fina alayhi? Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray in his sandals? قَالَ نَعَمْ Anas رضي الله عنه, he said yes. He said yes. Ibn al-Arabi رحمه الله تعالى, he mentioned uh, about a na'al. A na'al is the sandal. A na'al is the sandal. He said, a na'al libas al-anbiya. That the na'al and the sandals, these are, this is from the garments or the clothing of the prophets. This is from the clothing of the prophets. وَإِنَّمَا اتَّخَذَ النَّاسُ غَيْرَهَا And the only reason the people would wear something other than that or started to wear something other than that is because of the mud and the lice that is in their lands. Because the mud of the mud that is in their lands. And then he clarified, Rahimahullahu ta'ala, وَقَدْ يُطْلَقُوا النَّعْلُ عَلَى كُلِّ مَا يَقِي القدم. That the word na'al, originally it means the sandal. And it was, it's the type of shoe that has uh, the bottom part, the sole, and then it has a place with a string coming up, and then two strings coming off of that, off of that, that going to the side. And one will place his foot in there in this manner. This is called a na'al, what we call today as a, as a sandal, in this manner. So this is what was intended here by the na'al, but he said, rahimahullahu ta'ala, that likewise, the, this word na'al, it could be used for any type of uh, clothing that protects the foot. Any type of clothing that protects the foot. And it has been mentioned by the uh, some of the ulama. They mention, uh, you, you say, an-na'lu. Or an-na'latu. You say, in, in this manner, an-na'l. Or you can call it an-na'latu. An-na'latu. But in any case, an-na'l is, it is considered feminine. And he says, Hiya ma wukiyat bihi al-qadam. That which is protected, that, that, which is the, that which the foot is protected by way of. So the na'al is something that protects the foot, meaning it's a shoe. It's a shoe. Originally, it means a sandal, but uh, some of the people of knowledge have mentioned that it is also referred to everything that is worn on the foot. You need to pr- protect the foot. This is considered na'al. So therefore, the ruling is, is general like this, praying in shoes. Is it permissible to pray in shoes? Did the Prophet ﷺ pray in his sandals? Yes. Anas radiallahu anhu, he says that he used to pray uh, in his sandals. So we see that uh, in this narration, there are many benefits. And from them, the diligence of the Salaf, from the Tabi'een, to learn. And that they would also uh, seek to verify the Sunnah and to authenticate the knowledge. And they would ask in this manner. فَاسْأَلُوا أَحْلِ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Complying to the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla and ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. So we see Abu Maslama, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's coming to Anas and he's asking about this issue. Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pray in his shoes? And he's seeking understanding and guidance in this affair. And this is the way of a believer. A believer, he seeks knowledge. If it's unclear to him, he'll go to the people who know. And he will ask them. And he will seek clarification in his deen. Likewise, we see in this narration, the legislation and the permissibility of praying in shoes. Of praying in, su- in shoes. And uh, the ulama, they have no difference of opinion about this. And that it's permissible. 
there is no difference of opinion from the ulama and Allah knows best the, about the permissibility of praying in the shoe in the shoes. Yani and no It's permissible. The one who prays in his shoes, then his prayer is proper and good. And so long as his shoes do not have any najasa or filth inside of them or, or on them. Do not have any filth on them. And this narration has been narrated from Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, خَالِفُ الْيَهُودَ فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُصَلُّونَ فِي نِعَادِهِمْ وَلَا خِفَافِهِمْ Differ from the Jews. Differ from the Jews. Verily, they do not pray. They do not pray in their sandals nor in their khifaf, any the, the, the leather socks. Differ from the Jews. So this is something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has actually ordered and commanded. Differ from the Jews. Be different from them. And this is something that is a foundation and a fundamental principle in the deen. Mukhalafat al-Yahud, Mukhalafat al-Nasara, Mukhalafat al-Kuffar, Umuman. To differ from them. To differ from the Jews and the Christians and that which is specific to them, especially in their actions of worship, especially in their rituals and their deen. And to be different from the disbelievers altogether, especially in the affairs that are related to their religion and their, reli- and their religious ceremonies and the likes like this, to differ from them. To differ from them entirely, especially in that which is in their religious ceremonies and their rituals and the, that which is related to their deen. And likewise, with regards to anything that is specific to them and that they are well known for, to be different from them and to not be like them or to resemble them. And in this manner, it has been narrated from Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma and Sunan Abi Dawood and likewise in Mustad Imam Ahmed from an authentic narration that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, Man tashabaha bi qawmin fuwa minhum. Man tashabaha bi qawmin fuwa minhum. That whoever resembles our people or imitates the people, then he's from them. And a person, he will only, only imitate those who, uh, who he likes. And he huwa inna ma yushbihu man yu'ajibu. Oh, man to ajibu hu haduhu. He only, an individual, he's only going to imitate and resemble and look like somebody that he likes or that he is amazed with their affair or he thinks that they're upon goodness. So therefore, the one who one imitates, then he's from them. He's from them. And this is a thread. Yadhan billah. Who would want to be from the people of the fire? Ashab al-Jahim. Na'udhu billahi min dhalika. Wa huma al-Yahudu wa nasara Wa kathalika al-Mushrikuna wa al-Kufar. Kulluhum min ashab al-Nar. Man mata ala hadha. Fa'innahu min ashab al-Nar. The one who died upon those ways. Then verily he's from the people of the fire. How could a believer suffice for himself and be happy for his soul and be pleased with his soul? And he to imitate the people of the fire and the enemies of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as'al Allah al-afiyah wa salama. Therefore, from that aspect, likewise here in the prayer, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he ordered the believers to pray in their shoes. To pray in their shoes and to pray in their khifaf, in their leather socks and the likes like this. Uh, in order to differ from the Jews because they don't do that. In order to differ from the Jews, because they do not do that. But uh, the people of knowledge, likewise, they have clarified that this is uh, in in the case whenever it's possible, uh, and whenever it's suitable. And uh, and in those days, the 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 masjid, the the carpets that were laid down for the masjid were not carpets that were made from uh, material and the likes like that. Rather, they were laid with with rocks and with stones. And uh, it was made from dirt and the lice like this. As for today, the masajid, they have carpets in them that are made from material that are expensive and that become dirty and filthy very easy. And they also can uh, retain the, the, the smell and the filth very easily. And the carpets, if they become dirty, they can become ruined and they become, they become, become filthy. And they're expensive to replace and the lice like this. So therefore, with regards to praying with the shoes inside the masajid that have these type of carpets in them, then this is not uh, recommended. This is not allowed. And the one who thinks like this, then he has the wrong understanding. And this is because there are other principles in the deen likewise. And from that is that it is not allowed to waste money and to wear the shoes on the carpet day in and day out, over and over, especially the way the masjid is visited frequently, five times a day like this, and the people uh, bringing their shoes left and right into the, into the masjid, and this person and that person, he's here and there, and this one is working there, and this one is working here. And this is going to cause the carpets to become filthy quickly. And this is a lot of money to replace often, and this is wasting money. This is wasting money. This is wasting money, and this is bringing filth into the masjid. So therefore... One would not say, oh, the Prophet sallallahu he commanded to pray in the shoes so he will bring his shoes, his shoes in the masjid like in the masjid that we have today with the nice carpets that are comfortable and clean and the lights like this, bringing that filth and dirty and, and, and dirty and causing the masjid, the, the, the carpets of the masjid to become dirty and, and, and stinky and smelly and the lights like this. But rather, if he wants to pray in his shoes, let him do that in his home. 
Let him walk with his shoes in his own in, on his own carpet if, if 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 he wants to apply the sunnah. And many of them they won't walk on their own carpet with their shoes because they know that it brings dirt into their houses. So therefore, likewise, we wouldn't do that to the houses of Allah. But if a person he's traveling, or if a person he's outside, or if a person he's pr- praying outside of the masjid on the concrete, or on the grass, or on the sand, then he'll wear his shoes and he'll remember the sunnah and he will have an intention to apply the sunnah. So therefore, he will not apply the sunnah in every circumstance, in every situation, in this manner like this, but rather there are other principles and other issues and, and fundamentals that one must observe and remember and uh, apply. And from that, one will not waste the, waste the wealth and one will not. Uh, make yada'at al-mal and he's wasting the wealth by ruining the carpets and causing uh, the masajid to purchase carpets time after time in this manner so therefore likewise it is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to pray in the shoes and uh, the people of knowledge have clarified that, that this is in uh, situations when it's suitable to pray in the shoes like for example when one is outside or on the road or on the path or on the concrete or on the dirt or on the sand or on the grass and the likes like this as for on the carpets then this is not recommended because of what happens from the filth and the dirt coming to the carpet and the carpet being ruined and thus the money being wasted wallahu ta'ala alam hadha wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam